morning YouTube. So here's a different video than what I normally do. This is one I don't, you know, when you're watching YouTube, you see lots of stuff come up and you know what it suggests to you. And lately I keep seeing things for like top speed runs on 600s, whether it be an R6 or a Gixxer 600, the ZX6R, things like that. And I always allow myself to get drawn into these stupid arguments with people. Um, it's a failing of mine. When I see someone say something dumb, I can't help but comment on it. <laughs> I admit that's a, that's a, that's a, my thing here, but anyway, you know, it, it, and it's weird cause it's always with the 600 guys for some reason, you see so many wild claims and I don't know if it's, be, I'm assuming a lot of these guys are noobs just by the fact of they have no track videos. They almost never have videos of them doing any like actual fast riding in the twisties or in the turns. It's always on the interstate with a cheap pair of gloves, um, t-shirt, uh, sketchers or flip-flops or tennis shoes, half the time shorts, and they're just doing roll-ons on the interstate. And, then, and this is funny because I see it even with uh, some of the bigger, um, some of the bigger names out there. So I'm not gonna call them out, it's, it's, it is what it is. They do their thing, I do my thing, whatever. Um, but you know, there's a lot of well-known YouTube motorcycle vloggers out there and they've, they'll show off it. And they're, granted, they're very successful. They have very good entertaining things. I, I'm a subscriber to them. Um, you know, and it's like they're showing off their garage of, you know, $250,000 worth of bikes. Every one of them's got chicken strips on them a mile wide, still got nubbins on the tires. And when you do see them riding, it's just going down the interstate and doing roll on racing and they call themselves racers. And, and to me, if you're not wearing gear and you're out there just going in a straight line, but you're not even at a drag strip where launching properly, especially on a leader bike these days, you know, to get a good time at the drag strip, you have to actually have to know what you're doing. Um, doing roll-ons from second gear on the interstate, you're not a racer. You're, you're a poser. Um, anybody can do that. You can literally train a monkey to twist the throttle. You're not worried about flipping the bike. You're not worried about reaction times. Any of the things that you have to worry about, traction, stuff like that, like you do on a drag strip, just pinning it and hanging on, you know, a child can do that. Get it to a turn, which none of these guys ever do, and I, I'm guessing it's a quite a different story. So... I think the uh, same goes for a lot of the 600 guys. So what I did was, you know, I, we've owned a lot of bikes. Between my wife and I over the years, I think we're up to like 37 or 38 bikes and she's shopping for another one. So I went back and I looked at, you know, because a lot of these videos are on the 600s and I've seen these claims. I've even seen like a Yami Noob claiming, you know, these are the fastest 600s and quoted the ZX6R as, you know, a top speed of 175. Not unless you shoot it out of a cannon or push it out of an airplane at, you know, 30,000 feet. I have one. It, it doesn't go that fast. It's impossible for it to go that fast. But so many people will go out there and they'll do their top speed runs and they're going by what's on the speedometer. <laughs> and I'm just going to show you why this is, for the most part, pretty much impossible. So if you go to Gearing Commander, really great site, gearingcommander.com, you can load up all the different brands of bikes, all the models, and pull up the gearing charts it has all the gear ratios internally in the gearbox, the final. You can change sprockets and, and so you can see what the impact will be. And it will tell you at a given RPM, how fast will your bike be? So when you look at something like that, you say, okay, I pulled up the uh, ZX6R for 07 to 12. Um, and so what you see is, well, it's top speed of a, a red line of 15.5, 172 miles an hour. And people get out there on the interstate and they go and their speedometer says, you know, 167. I see one guy with 177. A 600 does not have the horsepower to do that. Isle of Man race TT bikes are barely hitting those speeds. And those are like way beyond anything that anybody is riding on the street here. Um, you know, those have extensive motor work um, done to them to get them to that point where they can do that. So... You see that, you go, well, the top speed of the bike. This is, in, this is in a vacuum. If you're on the dyno, right, and you had no wind resistance, and that's, the, that's what we're going to get into here is the physics. It's easy to say, well, you know, if at Redline in top gear, the bike does this. That's, it, that's saying that's what the gearing is limited to. All things, if there was no wind resistance, no rolling resistance, no um, aerodynamic loss from the rider, um, on the bike, because that's a big part of the aero package and why bikes at higher speeds are worse than cars because the drivers inside the car, the aerodynamics don't change when you go faster in a car. It can cut through the wind better, whereas me hanging on the back of a bike, I'm going to slow the bike down because I'm not designed in, an, uh, in a wind tunnel, despite the bike maybe having been. So 
when you look at this, you'll see, okay, that's the top speed in a vacuum on the dyno if, there are, if there's no wind resistance. Well, there's a lot of wind resistance at 172 miles an hour, okay? <laughs> um, if you, any of you guys watched Top Gear, there was an episode they were talking about the Veyron, and then they came out with the Veyron Supersport, where in order to go only seven miles per hour faster, they had to add a little over 200 horsepower. So just to increase the top speed by seven, they had to add 200 horsepower because the faster you go, the more the wind pushes back, which means the more horsepower you need to push through the wind. It's not about the weight of the bike at that point. It's about the drag coefficient, which is your wind resistance, and how much horsepower do you have? Are you able to overcome that wind resistance pushing back on you? And if you go five miles an hour faster, now the wind is pushing back a little harder. So to go a little bit faster than that, you need even more horsepower. It just keeps going up and up as far as your horsepower requirements. So that 172 is in a vacuum. Well, let's look at the power here. So I pulled up some of the bikes we've had over the years, had on the dyno. Got a, my wife's 2011 GSX-R600, had a, did have a DCAT and M4 slip-on and an air filter. Um, she also had, well, three of these are hers. She had a 2007 CBR600RR that was stock. She also had a 27, uh, 2007 Cowie ZX6R with the two brothers slip-on. And then my friend, um, his he also had a 2007 Cowie ZX6R. So you look at the horsepower here, peak horsepower, you know, 107, 111, 105, 112. Newer R6s and the newer ZX6Rs that are a 636 motor, you put a pipe on them and stuff like that, you tune them. You know, you're getting 115 on the lower end up to maybe 120. If you see some guy with an R6 claiming he's got 131, ask him what motor work he did because he had to have ported the heads, um... You know, done, you know, done all that, that smoothing and stuff like that. Probably uh, race head gasket to bump the compression, then a retune, ignition advance. You, you have to do a lot. You have to basically do like a super sport build to get a 600 up in that almost Jixxer 750 ter 50 territory. You can do it, but it's not stock. You're not going to get that with a slip-on and, and a power commander is my point. So when you look at that horsepower, that's not that much. And it's delivered in the peak horsepower over here, you can see, is at around 14,000 and starts to drop off. So even though you can rev it out to 15.5, so you can say, well, with an ECU flash, you can, you can, you know, extend the rev limiter and stuff like that. Yeah, you can. You know, 15.5 would be out of here. But if you continue that downward trend, the more you rev it past the peak horsepower, the less power you make. So you look at this peak power here. And you say, okay, that's where my peak horsepower is. If I have a chance of hitting red line in sixth with all that wind resistance, it's going to be here. It's going to be where that peak power is because as I go past 14,000, I got another 1,500 revs to go. I'm making less and less power, which means I'm less and less likely to continue pulling to hit that red line. So where are you at 13,950? Okay, let's say 14,000 is where your, your peak is. You're in the 150 somewhere. That's if you have stock gearing. Now, what happens with a lot of bikes, like the newer, since 2018 and up, I think, the ZX6R went to a 15-tooth front sprocket. So let's change that. I've already loaded that in here. Let's just hit and get the yellow one. That means the theoretical top speed, if you can hit 15.5 in six gear, is only going to be 161. At 14,000-ish where your peak is, you're still in the 140s. Now, that's actual. That's actual speed, not what your speedo shows. Motorcycle speedometers are notoriously high. On average, 5%. Some of the older bikes, before you had traction control and ABS, most of the bikes had a, a wheel speed sensor on the counter shaft, and it basically did the math. It knew, you know, they the, the programmed the math into the ECU, saying, okay, with these sprockets and this size tire... However fast the counter shaft sprocket is spinning, multiply it by this multiplier and your top speed, you know, your, your, your speed should show as X, right? So as your tire wears, that goes off because you're changing the diameter and the circumference of the tire. So it's going to have to spin faster because it's shorter to go the same speed. So that's going to cause it to read higher. And then a lot of guys would do sprocket changes. Everyone says, oh, the quick acceleration kit for the for the 600. So it would give them the, the acceleration more on par with the 750. And the really popular one to do was down one in the front. So from 16 to 15 and then up two teeth in the back. So 43 to 45. What does that make your top speed look like? That's 154. Again, assuming you can actually hit that 15.5 in six gear. 
Now, the good news here is that as you go down in gearing, you're more likely to hit that. You've got more mechanical advantage. You're able to apply that force more efficiently to the to the rear tire. And so you're actually more likely to hit red line. So there are cases where by lowering your gearing slightly, you might actually increase your top speed slightly. Now, this doesn't apply to every bike. But if there's a bike that, you know, your red line's 12, but in top gear because of the wind resistance, you're only able to hit 10.5 and the bike just can't pull any harder to get to that peak power um, or to get to the red line, um, lowering the gearing slightly might allow you to actually move it up. But that doesn't apply to every bike. But this is, I mean, these are realistic. This is, this is again, this is in a vacuum. When even if you do the quick acceleration kit, and I've seen a guy claiming, oh, well, I'm running uh, ZX10 gearing. You know, I raised my gearing on my 600, and that's how I'm able to hit 187. No, you're not hitting 187 on a 600 anyway, and you sure as hell aren't doing it when you raise the gearing. You may raise your theoretical gearing here. If we go back here to stock, and let's say, I think he said he went to like a 40, or I think he went down in the back to like a 38 or something, something crazy. So let's see what that looks like. Yeah, theoretically, <laughs> the gearing is now geared to where if you could hit, if there was a vacuum and you had no wind resistance at all, and you could hit 15.5, sure, the bike could do that. The problem is little 600 doesn't have the power. 600s just don't make that much, and they typically make it here, and then they start signing off. So you can extend the rev limiter all you want, but the more you rev it, the less horsepower you're going to make. It's just how it works. If you want to go a true 170 plus, you need to start getting up to like a leader bike. Maybe a Panigale V2 because it's a 959. Um, it's, you know, Ducati calls that a middleweight, but that's really, you know, you're getting to leader bike at that point. You know, you're, you're almost at a thousand cc's, even if it's a twin. But if you want to start going like a true 170 plus, especially if you want to get closer to 180 and, and up, you need a leader bike. You need an R1. <laughs> you need, I had a Tuono V4 1100. You know, you're talking about bikes that are pushing 160, almost 166, 172 and a half to the rear wheel. The difference here in the performance is staggering. Now down here in the low range, because these bikes just want to flick you off and, you know, from a dig, the 600s are easier to launch. So you can say up to 100, you know, the 600s kind of hold their own because they're lighter. They're not trying to flip you off. Traction control, wheelie control is not cutting in and cutting power the way it does on a, on a leader bike. And 600s do fairly well against leader bikes, even though they're not going to be faster. But as you start getting up into triple digits, this 50 horsepower, that's what makes a bike go from 150, 155 top speed to 185. It's that extra 50 horsepower. It's like the Veyron. You need horsepower. You need aerodynamics to cut through the wind efficiently, which most modern sport bikes are all going to be, you know, on a similar playing field. They all spend time in a wind tunnel. So whether it's a Cowie versus the Honda, not that critical. It's the horsepower that makes a difference. Leader bikes have it. 600s don't. That's the realistic, uh, that, that's the reality here. So if you're on a 600 claiming, oh yeah, I do 170 on the interstate all the time and I pull on R1s and crap. No, you don't. If you're pulling on R1s, your buddy has it in rain mode. You've geared your bike down really low so that you've got great acceleration lower down, but that just means you're going to run out of top speed sooner. It also means your speedometer, instead of being 5% off, if you haven't installed a speedo healer and actually calibrated it on a dyno or with a verified GPS or something, your speedo could be off by 18%. What is 18%? If you're looking at a... Um, and that's typically what it is if you do the quick acceleration kit, down one tooth in the front and up two in the back. Add in the 5% of inherent speedo error that most of the uh, motorcycle manufacturers build in. So if you're saying, oh yeah, my bike, I saw 173 on the dyno. Well, subtract 18%. <laughs> so multiply that by 0.82%. So you're only getting 82% of that. Your top speed, when you've done the quick acceleration kit and you saw 173 on the dyno, Oh, I'm sorry, on the road, you know, as your top speed. If you haven't corrected your speedo properly, your top speed is actually in the low 140s, give or take. Now, your, your bike, you may say, well, it wasn't 18%. It was only off 16, whatever. You can do the math. The point is, is that when you change the sprockets, you are radically changing the gearing. Now, newer bikes should account for that. Because they have to have, for the traction control and ABS algorithms, they have wheel speed sensors on each wheel. So regardless of what the gearing is, 
It knows what the actual wheel's doing, and those tend to be more accurate, although they'll still be a couple percent high. It's that it won't be that high when the gearing changes. So the, the new bikes are, tend to be fairly close. They're like 3% off, things like that. And, it's, and when you add gearing, it doesn't change that. It's just the 3%. But if you're seeing 165 and you say, okay, well, let's just multiply that by 0.97 because you're, you're subtracting the 3%, you know, you're only off by a few miles an hour. And most 600s that are, you know, you know, even if you got a pipe and a tune and an ECU flash, most 600s should be in the, in the 150s. Um, the new 636, which is what I have, comes with the 1543 gearing. So that's uh, yellow, that's current. You know, topped out, if I'm actually hitting 15.5, I'm only seeing 161 actual. Now, I have seen 157, 158 on the Speedo, but I don't know that that's accurate. I was probably doing a true honest, if it said 157, 158, I was probably doing an honest 151-ish. 600s, again, they're very quick. They're agile. They rip on the track. They're a lot of fun. They're very potent and capable sport bikes, but top speed demons, they are not. So for all you guys out there squidding it up and riding your 600s and claiming you're beating leader bikes and claiming, oh, my 600, you know, I've got a, a 2003 Jixxer 600 that does 174. No, it doesn't. Your speedo is way the hell off. It doesn't make that kind of power. In fact, out of the 600s, the Jixxer is one of the slowest ones out there. It's a great bike. It handles well. But power-wise, the Jixxer 600s were not known for making a lot of high power. In fact, on at least out of the 600s we've had, and I could even throw up some other ones in here, like the uh, Daytona 675. Um, the Jixxer 600 is, is if that one had not had the slip-on uh, and the cat removed, that 107 would have been down 103. In fact, I think when we did baseline it, it was 103 stock. So it was even less than the Honda CBR 600 RR was stock. Jixxer 600s just aren't that fast. The Cowies are good, and the R6s are good. Those tend to make the best power out of the 600s because the R6 does rev a little higher, doesn't make a lot of torque, and the party doesn't really get started until after 10,000 RPMs. Um, but up top, they do pull nice, and the chassis on those things are amazing. They're probably the best all-around track bike. Um, and the ZX6R, you know, the newer ones, they're, 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 they call them the cheater bikes. It's a 636. So those do tend to make a bit more power. But again, even with a pipe and tune, maybe you did a really good job on the tune and stuff and you're, you're, you got 120 at the wheel, it's just not that much power. You're still, you're not even in the ballpark of leader bikes, which is what's needed to do that 175, 180, 185 and all that. So hate to burst your bubble, guys. This is simple physics. I know some of you said, well, I have the GPS on my phone. I don't know how accurate those are. And again, when you look at the data and you look at the charts themselves, you're you're not going to hit these speeds. <laughs> you're just not. You're you're in a vacuum in order to hit that. Why is that one off? Oh yeah, because I changed that one. So let's go back to 43 teeth. You know, so let's look at one of the other bikes um, that's really popular. So um, let's see. Let's go to a Yamaha. Where the Well, that'd be alphabetic. So there. So we got Yamaha. Um, let's see. YZF R1. Let's see. Let's take an R6 08 to 16. Load the gearing. Let's bump up her. All right. So stock. All right. So it says that again, in a bubble, if you can hit that 16.5, that it'll be. Um, a 181. It's a, it's a 600. You're not going to hit that. An R6 that's properly tuned and set up with a small rider and a tuck, you could break 160, maybe low 160s if you've got a really nicely set up bike. You're not hitting 180. It just doesn't make that kind of work. Because again, just because it revs to 16.5, if it's 16.5, unfortunately, I don't have an R6, but it follows along with the rest. It may redline there, but your peak is probably going to be around 15 or 15.5. And after that, it drops power. So while you may make 118 or something at the wheel, that's at a lower RPM. None of these, you'll notice, none of these are at redline. The max power is always well below redline, like 1,000 RPMs, 1,500 RPMs below redline. So the chances of you hitting redline 
are pretty slim. If you go back to the chart, you say, okay, with stock gearing, where is it at 15,000 RPM? Because that may be more realistic. You know, you're going to be around in that low 160s. So the R6 is probably the fastest 600 out there. It's, it's kind of close between it and the Cowie, although not anymore because Cowie lowered the gearing. They wanted more, uh, more acceleration and more drive, maybe because the ZX6R is a little more made for the street and not the track. So the top speed on the ZX6R now is 161. And that's, again, in a vacuum at 15.5 with no wind resistance. Obviously, you can't do that in real life <laughs> unless you're sitting on the dyno. So anyway, just thought I would do this. I know I'll probably get, maybe see if we get some comments from some of the guys. A lot of the guys have 600s that consider themselves racers because they do roll-on tests on the interstate. Just stop, dude. People who really know how to ride typically don't go around bragging about it. They just ride their ride. Um, but also, those guys aren't worried about top speed. They're not worried about a horsepower number. The guys that really know how to ride, the actual racers, they let the lap time do the talking, you know? Or maybe if they're on a twisty, you know, challenging technical road, whoever gets to the end first, because that doesn't lie. Um, just going in a straight line with your buddies on the interstate, it's fun, it's exhilarating, um, but there's no skill involved in that. You're not launching the bike, you're not doing anything. And so, you know, as they say, fast bikes are for straight lines, Turns are for fast riders. Um, and I'm not claiming to be the fastest rider by any means. But I just thought I'd kind of set the record straight here that <laughs> theoretical top speed um, and actual top speed are two very different things. You got to look at that, where that is. And you have to say, can I actually hit red line? Because you can in lower gears, but then it gets harder and harder. And that's, that's why... So when you're looking at your acceleration, you know, in first gear, the acceleration's savage. Second's really good. Third is strong. Fourth, as you start getting those upper RPMs, you'll notice that your RPMs start climbing slower the higher the gear you get into. Some of that could be the gear ratio internally, but also it's because as you go faster, that wind is pushing back against you harder. And it's becoming harder and harder for the motor to overcome that wind resistance. That is your enemy. And the only thing that really beats wind resistance, you can't really change the, I mean, you could tuck a little better, you could lose a couple pounds, but really the only thing meaningfully meaningful that you can do to go faster on a bike when it comes to top speed is to add power. You gotta be able to just, because the air, the air pushing back is not gonna change. <laughs> so all you can do is add more power to overcome it, not adding higher gearing. That makes it harder. The engine's trying to work harder it has less acceleration. It's less able to pull th through that wind. You actually want to lower the gearing to make sure that your RPMs are up in that optimal range where you're making max power. The key to going faster is power. Speed and power, as Jeremy Clarkson would say. So there you have it. Your 600 is not as fast as you think it is. Chew on that for a while. <laughs>